where did he get the information from? He had a magid. He had a voice that spoke to him from heaven and revealed to him the Shulchan Aruch. Of course, you can read it inside, but he, he used to talk and learn with a magid. We're going to uh, chapter Shin Yud Chet. This is page... Um, okay. I will show you. Yes. It's Hebrew letters. Pay, it's uh, Shin Yud Chet Gimel. Shin Yud Chet Gimel. Chapter 318. Paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. This is called Shabbos uh, Pashas Truma. The Shabbat of Truma. Truma talks about the uh, donations to the Mishkan, to the tabernacle. And uh, the Beis HaLevi, who's Rabbi Yosef uh, Dov Soloveitchik, he wrote a parish on the Torah. He's a giant Torah scholar in uh, Lithuania. And he wanted to suggest, last week we had Parsha's Mishpatim. We had the, the Parsha of the civil laws. Followed by this week where we have the donations to the... Mishkan, to the tabernacles. He says, why does the donations of the parts of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, come after the civil laws? And he wants to, and, and it's interesting because the house of Soloveitchik, his name was Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, and him and his son, and his, they were very well known that they championed the poor people. They always stood up for the poor people, and they were very simple they never put on airs. They were giants in Torah. But they, they liked the poor people. The rich people, sometimes they had problems with. He said, because when a person gives money for a holy purpose, he has to make sure that his money is kosher money. He has to go back to the previous week's Torah portion to make sure that he does everything according to the Torah, that his money is clean and kosher money. And then he can give it to the temple, to, to Hashem. If not, it's a problem. We know in the world there's many people who make money among the general world, I hope not among the Jewish world, they make money in an improper way, and they give it to charity in order to make them feel good in their heart. But it doesn't go like that. Okay. Pardon me? Likoshai? Koshai? Kosher. Kosher. Ah. It means acceptable. Permitted. Permitted. Very good. Good. I want to go to. Okay, let's go to Aleph. Okay, Aleph, here. Ha-mevashel v'shabbos. What's mevashel? Cook. Cook, someone who cooks on Shabbos, and the Ramah adds, O she-osachas mishar malachos, or he did one of the other malachos. How many malachos are there? Forty. Minus one. That's there are forty minus one avos malachos, general categories. Every av, the Gemara in the, the Yerushalmi tells us in the name of Reish Lakish, he brings in the introduction here. Every one of the thirty-nine father categories of malacha has thirty-nine children categories. So there are these, and these are all Torah laws. Torah laws. So we have thirty-nine times thirty-nine. Okay, that's the number of Torah, of Torah laws. B'mezid. What's mezid mean? Someone who cooks on, uh, or breaks Shabbos b'mezid. Purpose? It means, don't do that. I'm going to do it anyway. That's called mezid. Right? Asur lo olam. He never may be, uh, get benefit from that malacha forever. Ul achirim mutar Shabbos. Other people may get benefit from that malacha, from that act of forbidden work on Shabbos, on Motzei Shabbos, after Shabbos goes out. That means if you, t- if you see a person 
cooking. And you say, don't do that. You're not allowed to do that on Shabbos. And he says, I'm going to do it anyway. And he cooks it. He may never eat that food. Of course, obviously, if he goes like this, he doesn't really care. But let's say he does tshuva right away. Immediately he realized what he did wrong. Ah! God, what did I do? And he wants to repent, come back to Hashem. That food is forever uh, forbidden to him. Other people can eat it after Shabbos. But you can't eat it on Shabbos. Now, that's if he does it b'mezid. Mezid usually is... Okay, now we have a shogeg. Shogeg, shogeg means by accident. Which means either he doesn't know it's Shabbos, he thinks it's Sunday... Or he thinks he knows it's Shabbos, but he thinks what he's doing is permitted. You learned this one time already? Mm-hmm. You know all of this. It's good to do a reveal. Yeah. Good. Shogeg. Shogeg means like either I don't know it's Shabbos, or I know it's Shabbos, but I think what I'm doing is okay. Mezid is the classic case of mezid, like we saw before. I have a kosher hamburger store, and I have a tray hamburger store right next to each other. I have a McDonald's and kosher, right next to each other. Same price, the same quality, everything is the same. And he says, I am not going in the kosher, I'm going in the McDonald's. That's called Mezi. That's called Mezi. It's even called Lahachis. That's called Mezi to anger Hashem. There's another Mezi where I know what I'm doing is wrong. But I need to do it. I want to do it. That's called mezid as well. It's not as bad as the first case. And Shogik, like we said, is he doesn't know that what he's doing is wrong. He thinks it's okay. So now, if he cooks b'shogik by accident, osur bo b'yom gam la'acherim. Everyone is forbidden to eat that thing on Shabbos. Osur bo b'yom, it's forbidden on that day also for other people, similar to the one who did it on purpose. Ule erev mutar gam lo miyad. The difference, though, is after Shabbos, everyone may eat it, even the guy who cooked himself, since he did it b'shogeg. Later on, we will learn about if a Jew tells a non-Jew to do malacha for him on Shabbos, which minat Torah is permitted. Midurabonan, from the rabbis, you're not allowed to tell a non-Jew to do malacha. From the Torah, it's permitted. Many, many things we have on Shabbos are rabbinic, Prohibitions, like the example of the minefield. Anyone who's been Israel, in Israel for a long time remembers, they don't, they don't have them too much anymore. If you go to the Golan Heights, we always went to the Golan Heights, and the fields next to the road were sectioned off with barbed wire, and there were little yellow signs all along the field. And it said, caution, Mine, mines. There were minefields. The Syrians put millions of mines without maps. They just put millions of them to keep the Israelis from invading. The Israelis invaded and conquered Syria, or at least the Golanites, but the mines remained there. Now, when you have a minefield, you say, what am I talking about war stories for? When you have a minefield and you want to say, caution, be careful, there are mines here. Do you put the sign right now? Let's say, here's the mine, and you put the sign one foot away? Or you put the sign way, way, way back here, way far away. And that's the reason. That's the same thing here. The rabbis made fences way, way, way far away so that we should not come to touch the spiritual mind of breaking Shabbos, doing something forbidden on Shabbos. So many, many things that we have here are rabbinic. Okay. So that's the halacha. If a person does malacha on Shabbos, b'nei on purpose, he may never get uh, may ne- uh, benefit. After Shabbos, he may get. If it's by accident, everyone may get benefit after Shabbos. After Shabbos. Excellent question. Gino asks, what is the meaning of the word melacha? Melacha is translated in the world as work. But it doesn't mean work. My father used to go to work and he used to sit in an office, and he used to, uh, well, talking on a phone is a, is a problematic. My friend's father had a store, and he would sit in his store, 
and he didn't have an electric cash register. He had like a box with money. They had this thing like an abacus, but they didn't have a thing like you used to see in the shuk here, these old guys from uh, Turkestan and these places, they would use an abacus. And they would do it faster than you could push the buttons on a uh, real fast. So that is not malacha. You're, that's called work, but it's not malacha. I run my store, but that's not malacha. Malacha is one of the activities that was used in order to make, it's a difference of opinion, in order to make the tabernacle. Make the tabernacle and run the tabernacle. And run the tabernacle. Means we had to make the tabernacle. We had to catch deer. We had to kill the deer. We had to skin the deer. We had to treat the skins to make the curtains of the tabernacle. We had to plant wheat. We had to harvest wheat. We had to sift the wheat. All of those things are needed. Those are all the, 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 the activities that are called malacha. And if a person does one, like it says in the Torah several times, anyone who does any, it breaks the Sabbath gets the death penalty. Of course, we don't have the death penalty anymore, but it's severe. Okay, let's look at Mishnah Baruah. Mishnah Baruah here, right here. You got it here? Great. You have it there? It's Hamavasha. It says the one who cooks, or any malacha. Echad Hamavasha lesamachal o esasamamonim oi. Now, it doesn't matter if he cooks food or he cooks samamonim. Samamonim are dyes. The dye that was used for the skins. Right? We know that the skins that they used to make the Mishkan were dyed different colors. One oroselim odomim. They dyed it red. So they had to make dye. How did they make dye? They have some kind of a Material, some kind of a plant, and they cook it up in in a vat, a big boiling a boiling vat of water, and they cook it until the dye is absorbed in all of the water. I'm not so big; I don't know so much about it, but that's cooking samamanim. They're called samamanim. Um, if a person cooks a, a, a chicken on Shabbos, that comes under this category. If he cooks dye on Shabbos comes under this category, even though we don't eat the dye. It's still the same thing. Or someone who heats up water. There's another law in the laws of Shabbos that sometimes something that can be eaten raw, according to some opinions, that can be eaten raw is less severe to cook it. Lomai said, practically speaking, we don't hold that. But water can be drunk raw, so to speak, raw water. I don't need to cook water to drink it. Still, a person who boils water is transgressing a malacha of cooking. The huadin chalav, also milk. Milk. Milk can be eaten without cooking. Still. Okay. Now. He's chayev because it gets better through the cooking. Now, if something does not get better through cooking, let's say something is better raw than cooked, so that might have a different law. But if something gets better cooked than raw, so even though it can be eaten raw, so he gets taken into account for cooking, even though it can be eaten raw. Like water. You can eat raw water. Even though we don't think of water, water as raw. Uncooked water. Now, the echada of esapas. Now, doesn't matter if he's cooking or if he bakes. He said, I never cooked, I only baked. <clears throat> cooking, we normally say, is with water. Baking is without water, just with heat. Doesn't matter. All of it is one category. One category. If you look in the Mishnah, in the seventh parak of uh, Shabbos, if you look in the second Mishnah, it talks about the Avos Malachos, the main category of Malachos. And, what, and there it has what's called Sidura de Pas, the order of making bread, from planting till planting the wheat until make, baking the bread and everything that goes along. So that's just talking about something that is done, but it's not only 
the order of making bread, that is forbidden on Shabbos. Any kind of baking, cooking, roasting, all of those things. They're taking something that's raw and making it cooked. We have to get involved in actually what does that what what what, what does that entail, etc. etc. But taking something that's not cooked and making it cooked. And we'll see that there's a difference between liquids and solids. Because a liquid, by definition, after you cook it, if you leave it to cool off, it goes back to its original state. If you cook chicken and you leave it cold, it does not go back to raw chicken. <laughs> Maybe only in the, in the time of Mashiach, the chickens will come back to life. I don't know. So there is a, a change of uh, quality to the, to the item that you're going to eat. Now, it's all one subject. Cooking, baking. Da'afia, baking is from in the in the category in the matter of, of cooking. Except he says here, oh, oh, um, baking is for bread, and cooking is for other things. That doesn't mean we don't bake anything other than bread. We do. We bake a lot of things, but normally it's you can bake a potato, etc., etc. If someone smelts, I don't know where the word is called, smelt. You take metal and you heat it up till it turns liquid. It's called smelting. <laughs> or if someone heats up metal until it comes, becomes a glowing coal. This is called a tolada. We said before, there are 39 major categories. Each one of those 39 major categories has 39 derivatives. Those are called toledot. Children. Father and children. The toledot, the children, some people get this wrong. The children, the toledot, are also Torah prohibitions, except they're not actually the one that was used in the Mishkan. But uh, you looked over there in the, in the Yerushalmi, like I said, in the introduction of the Chafetz Chaim to this section, he talks about that Gemara. In the Yerushalmi, of the 39 derivatives for every 39 malachas. That's a lot of malachas. A lot. Of, I think it's 1,400. I don't know what it is. I'm not so good in the math, but um, it's a lot. And that's only Torah prohibitions. Then we have many rabbinic prohibitions to keep us far away from the minefield. So when it blows up over there, I don't get hurt by the explosion. We don't get too close to the Torah prohibition. Okay. Okay. Someone who melts wax. On Shabbos, or oh, a chaylev, or fat, he melts it. Of course, he's doing it through heat. He's doing it through heat. Or oh, a zephyr, or oh, a kofir, or he melts pitch or tar. It's all the same. How is it told us It's a tolada. It's a derivative of the main category of cooking, and it's chayav. You have to be careful of language, this code language. Every time the Mishnah, and this is basically just brought from the Mishnah, most of the time the Shulchan Aruch, he just brings halacha, he brings it from the Mishnah itself. The Ramor makes additions very often, but the language of chayav, especially when it comes to Shabbos, there's chayav and patur. And then there's a thing called asur. So chayav means obligated from the Torah. That means if a person does one of these things on Shabbos, of course he's only doing it by accident. We don't have people who are going to do it on purpose. So he has to bring a korban chatos when the temple is, uh, is uh, built. He has to bring a sin offering. And that means he's chayav. Asur means asur midrabanan. But patur from korban. But exempt from a sacrifice. So whenever you see the word asur, it means rabbinic. Chayav means Torah. Better be careful. Be careful on everything. I'm not, I'm not saying yet. We have to be careful on the rabbinic as well. It's brought down in many places that, being, that the test that Hashem has for us is being careful on the rabbinic. Because everybody's going to keep the Torah law, of course. But the rabbinic, oh, those rabbis, they're always adding these things. They're strict. No, we have to be careful on the rabbinic as well. The rabbinic is very important.
As we know, we're rabbinic Jews. They have Jews that say they're not rabbinic. We are rabbinic Jews. We are Pharisees. This time we were sitting and learning on our other base midrash, and uh, it's near a certain non-Jewish uh, fantasy site, and they have a lot of uh, Gentiles there. And one time, one of their men, he had one of these collars on like this. This thing, he was from Nigeria, and he came over and he asked us, "What are you?" So there was a guy there from France who knew these things, and he looked at the guy and he said, we're Pharisees. And the guy went, who? <laughs> because in their book, the Pharisees are the bad guys. In our book, the Pharisees are the good guys. We are Pharisees. Okay, anyway, it was funny. You're French, you can appreciate it uh, more. Because, uh, anyway. So let's continue a little bit. I want to read down. I want to skip down to number base in the Mishnah Barura. Down here. You see it? It says Bashabis. It says uh, it says someone who cooks on Shabbos, etc. etc. So he brings down here a very, very interesting law. This translates loosely as in any case where there's a machloikis rishonim, where there's an argument between the rishonim, who are, let's say, the rabbis of the level of the Rambam or the Rosh or the Rif or any of those rabbis. If there's an argument there, whether it comes under the category of cooking or not, or any malacha, or any other malacha, let's say I, I went ahead and I, 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 I made a mistake. So we said like this, we said, if someone cooks by mistake, we're only talking about mistake now because we're not in the world of people who do it on purpose. We make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, anyone who tells me that that they uh, they never made anything trace in their kitchen. Let's say the person is in a bite, he has a wife, he has a family, and he says to me, I never made anything trace in my kitchen then I probably will never eat in his house. Why? Because he probably doesn't know too much. And that's why he thinks he never got anything trafe, because I believe everybody got something trafe. I don't think there's anybody. And not on purpose, by accident. <coughs> Had my famous case. We used to make, on Purim, we used to make big hoagies. They call them heroes. You get a big baguette, and we used to make meatballs. It's tomato sauce and make baguettes and give them out and a can of beer. That was my mishmach manot. So one, I used to go to Meitzad, which is outside of Jerusalem on Purim, and then come back at the end of the day and have our Purim here. So I came back into my house. It was there at Purim, and I smell, ah, I smell that those meatballs clicking, and I can smell them. And I look on the stove and I see that they're cooking in a milk pot. The milk pot is a big pot, but just like the meat pot, except it has a little blue on the side. They didn't see the blue, and they made a big pot of meatballs in the milk pot. So it turned out that the meatballs are kosher, and the pot has to be kosher. But everybody makes mistakes. So now... We want to know what happens if I cook by mistake. Did the Evid? Now, um, let's say it's something, whether it's an argument, whether it's called cooking or not. An example might be um, if I had uh, something that was cooked totally and liquid. We'll get into it later on. And liquid. And uh, then it cooled off. Say I had a soup, or I had a big stew, a pot of meat with sauce, gravy, and it's totally cooked, and it totally cooled off. And then 
I cooked it again on Shabbos. I heated it up. So according to some opinions, that's totally permitted from the Torah. From the Torah. For example, uh, the Ramor is going to hold that. It's called Ein Bishul Achar Bishul. That's something that's cooked, even if it cools off. If it cooks again, it's not called cooking. It's permitted from the Torah. The Shulchan Aruch is, it argues. And these are these two opinions are based on Rishonim. You have the Rambam and the Ran and, uh, and the Rashba on one side, who hold that it's not called cooking. And you have Rashi and the Rosh on the other side, holds it is called cooking. So this perhaps is a place where there's an argument whether this activity comes under the category called cooking. And therefore, with the Evid, it'll be mutter. You'll be able to eat it on Shabbos. Like it said, in the Shulchan Aruch, it said if a person cooks by mistake, it's forbidden for everybody on Shabbos and permitted for everybody after Shabbos. But here we might say uh, that after the fact, you can eat it even on Shabbos. Dechol ha'isar azeh hu rak midorabonan shekansuhu the whole prohibition of eating food that was cooked on Shabbos. You'll ask a person, this guy cooked on Shabbos. Are you allowed to eat that food? No, of course not. Terrible guy. Not. Does the Torah say that? Yes, the Torah says he's a terrible guy and you can't eat that food. The answer is that's not true. He is a ter- Well, he's not a terrible guy. He did it by accident. But the Torah never said anything about what you do with the food or the other things that were produced by this illegal malacha. Really, in Torah, if someone cooks on Shabbos, you're allowed, everybody is allowed to eat that food on Shabbos. Except the rabbis made a knas. In modern Hebrew, knas means a fine. It means we make you pay in order that it'll hurt your pocket. Not literally your pocket, we make a fine so that you won't do it again. You won't do it again. So here, not eating food that was cooked on Shabbos is rabbinic. And therefore, if it's a doubt whether this thing was pro- uh, prohibited or permitted, there it, it becomes a doubt on a rabbinic level. That's what he says. Uh, one moment. And a suffolk, a doubt in a rabbinic case is, uh, we're lenient, we're lenient. Okay. Okay. Let's jump down. There's a lot. There's a lot there. Me and uh, and Nachman Yosef spent a lot of time learning the halachas of Shabbos. You can learn them, and they're very important because Shabbos comes every week. Every seven days, without fail, Shabbos comes. You can go like this, like this. It's there. Friday, sunset. And it's and you see that Shabbos is the... I don't know. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a step. Shabbos is the holiest day. We say Yom Kippur is the holy day. The they say, oh, the Jews on their holiest day. It's definitely a holy day. Yom Kippur is, but Shabbos is the holiest day of our existence. And it comes every, every seven days. It's a day that we go, we leave this world in a way, and we go to a different... It came to my mind when you said that, Ikar Abracha. Huh? Shabbos is Ikar Abracha. Ikar Shabbos is the Ikar, the Mekor Habracha. It's the source of all blessing. We always say after we pray in the morning, we say, Hayom Yom Rishon B'Shabbos, Shani B'Shabbos. This is the first day of Shabbos, means the week. We call the week Shabbos. Shabbos is, there's nothing like Shabbos. And... When you learn these halachas, I know them very, very uh, superficially. I don't know them real well. Some of them I know better, some of them I know worse. And you find, when you learn the halachas of Shabbos, and the halachas of anything, like that guy who said, I never made anything in the house tray. Let him start learning Shulchan Aruch, you're going to say, oh. <laughs> So also, we see how much we need to still learn when it comes to Shabbos. There's a, whole, there's a lot of stuff in here. A lot of stuff. So some people... 
There's two parts of Shabbos. There's don't do, and then there's do. So don't do is don't do anything that breaks Shabbos. Don't cook. Don't break. The other thing is you have to do Shabbos. You have to pray. You have to actively take in the, the feeling and the spirit, spirituality of Shabbos. On everybody on his own level. I'm starting to taste a little bit, but uh, it's a big work. So some people, they sleep, go to sleep Friday night, and they wake up at like Saturday afternoon, and they don't do Shabbos. Okay. They're bored or whatever. They wake up to eat, and then they, but they don't, they're missing from Shabbos. Least they don't break Shabbos, because they're sleeping. They're missing. Okay, at any rate, let's continue a bit. Um, you're welcome. Adequa. Speak Spanish? Okay. In the uh, Sif Beis, uh, paragraph two, it talks about hashoichet. What's shoichet? Slaughter. Right? We learned that in, in the Gemara and Chulin. So now, we know that it says in the Torah that you have to keep the Torah and live according to them. Hashem gave us the Torah to live by and not to die by. That means if someone is sick up to a certain extent, and that's a whole different chapter back here, what's called sick, less sick, more sick, but if someone is dangerously sick, we break Shabbos to treat him. We break Shabbos to, to treat him. Except there's three things that we may not do to heal a sick person. That's called Shvichus Damim. I'm not allowed to murder someone in order to treat that person. Let's say, uh, I don't know, it says uh, you need... Uh, I can't imagine the case. But I'm not allowed to save my life or someone else's life by murdering, by gilu yarayas, by doing uh, immorality, and by doing idolatry. Those three things I cannot do, even if a person is going to die. But everything else, the doctor says, this person must eat pig, or he is endangering his life. So what do we do? We give the person pig. He's a religious person, he has payas and a beard, and he has tzitzis. The doctor says, you must break Shabbos. You must take him to the Shabbos, to, to the hospital in a car. Now, we go right there. We go right there. We break Shabbos. We break everything in the Torah except those three things to keep someone who's dangerously sick from getting worse and from possibly dying. Even possibly dying. So now, the doctor says, this person must have freshly slaughtered meat to eat right now. Whatever the sickness is. I don't know sicknesses, but a guy was sick, deathly sick, and they called the doctor, and the doctor said he must eat meat that is freshly slaughtered. Right now, you have to slaughter it. So what do we do? We slaughter a cow, a sheep, and feed him the, the meat. If he's going to eat the meat cooked or not cooked or whatever, that's a different story. He said, you must cook fresh cow meat. To, you must give him a freshly slaughtered steak, otherwise he's in danger of dying. And therefore, and there, it's not that it's permitted to slaughter the animal. It's a mitzvah to slaughter. It's an obligation to slaughter the animal. You must slaughter the animal to save the life of a Jew. Now, I slaughtered an animal on Shabbos in order to treat this person. Okay? Makes it, there's no difference whether the person was sick already or he became sick on Shabbos. Now you have to shecht, and I shecht it on Shabbos. Mutar habari lechol mimenu. Chai. And a healthy person can eat from that meat raw. He can eat from the meat raw. If the sick person needs cooked meat, he can eat it cooked. But a healthy person can eat from that animal as well raw. You say, wait 
a second. How can an animal, how can you, are you allowed to eat raw meat? Am I allowed to go to an animal? I shechted an animal, and I go to the animal, I, I hang it up. I shechted it five minutes ago. I cut a piece off, and I make a bracha shakol ni ebed varo, and I eat it. Is that permitted? What do you think? I shechted it, and I did not cook it, and I cut a piece off, and I'm going to let this person eat that raw meat. Is that permitted? Salted? What? Salted? Not allowed to salt meat on Shabbos. What? Was the meat salted? No. It says chai. Chai. You can eat chai. Chai means unsalted meat. I'm going to guess that you can. Why am I going to guess that you can? Because the Shulchan Aruch says you can. How can you eat raw meat? Why can't you eat raw meat? Because it has blood in it, right? We don't eat blood. In Germany, they eat blood. They eat blutwurst. They take blood and they make sausages out of it and they make it chill it. They eat blood. They eat blood. We actually come from Romania, so they have the vampires in Romania. The answer is, you're not allowed to eat blood. Two kind of blood you can't eat. You're not allowed to eat them. Maybe more than two. You're not allowed to eat. You're not allowed to eat the blood that's kanus, the blood that's caught in the body. Let's say in the chamber of the lungs or the stomach. That blood you can't eat. And you're not allowed to eat blood on the outside of the animal. I I cut a piece of meat off the live uh, of the dead animal, unsalted meat. It has blood on the outside. I can't eat that blood. I rinse that off. And I say shakomi evet vara, and I um, and I eat it raw. There's another kind of blood that I'm not allowed to eat. That's blood that moves from place to place. What causes blood to move from place to place? Two things: cooking and salting. So I'm not allowed to eat blood that. That's why I salt meat before it cooks. Because if I cook the blood before I salt it, the blood is moving from place to place, and I'm eating that blood now in the meat. So therefore, I salt it first. But I also salt. When I salt, I have to salt it properly so that all the blood comes out. But I can't do that on Shabbos. I can't because we're going to see about cooking. I can't cook on I, the problem of cooking for a sick person, which I can do. At any rate, so if I have an animal that I just slaughtered. I'm allowed to eat. I can take that meat and I can give it to a healthy person, and he can eat it uncooked after he washes the blood off the outside. <laughs> Let's continue, and we'll read the next part, and then we'll see what's the difference between this and the next case. Aval hamevashel, but if someone cooked on Shabbos lacholet for a sick person. A healthy person or a moderately ill person cannot eat from that. Why? Because we are suspicious. Maybe you'll cook more for the healthy person. Maybe you'll cook more for the healthy person. So therefore we say a healthy person may not eat from that meat that I cook for a sick person. Because maybe I'll cook for the healthy person, which I'm not allowed to do. So now we have the question. Why by the shechita I'm allowed to eat from the slaughtered animal, I'm allowed to eat the raw meat, but I'm not allowed to eat from the meat that was cooked for the sick person. Why by the slaughtering, yes, and by the meat and by the cooking, yes, uh, no. Because it said by the cooking, because maybe you'll cook more for him. The answer is, you can't shech that animal more. The animal's dead. You can't shech it again. Like they have, they have in the movies. They say, now I'm really going to kill you. What do you mean really going to kill you? He's dead already. The animal is dead. I can't shech it more than it is. So therefore, since I don't worry that, the, that I'm going to shech the dead animal more, so I can give the raw meat to a healthy person to eat. But not if I cook on Shabbos. Okay? Clear? Clear? 
ברוך אתה רואה לנו עיניים ומלך חורים של הקום. Because I said, there's only a certain number of, of blood that are forbidden. Blood in meat that has not started moving from place to place is permitted. And if you didn't cook it, and you didn't salt it, it hasn't moved from place to place. The only thing, blood on the outside of the meat you can't eat. I'm not sure if that's Torah law or rabbinic law. So I have to rinse off the blood on the outside, and the blood that's inside the meat is totally good. Only once I start salting. When I start salting, that's why in the halachas of salting, it's brought down that you have to salt it sufficiently to take out all the forbidden blood. Why? Because if I start salting it and I don't salt it sufficiently, the blood has started to move, but it hasn't been removed from the meat. Therefore, it's still in the meat. So then, perhaps, you could roast it and get rid of it. Roasting very often is a way that you can overcome problems of salt. But in general, the, the blood on the outside of the meat is forbidden, but the blood in the meat, before I salt it or cooked it, is permitted. <laughs> it's, I don't think it's so appetizing, but uh, <laughs> eat raw meat. It's probably a little bit tough, but okay. some people eat raw meat. Okay. I want to start Gimel. Gimel up here. Gimel. Keshem she'asur levashel ba'ur. Ur means... Ur, Avram Avinu came from what city? Ur. Ur Kasdim. Ur of the Chaldees, they call it. Ur Kasdim. Ur means a fire. It was like a fiery place. Everybody knows that that place was a fiery... Bavel was a strange place. The Jews ended up being the greatest that they've ever been when they were in these weird places. The Jews were in Lithuania. Biggest anti-Semites, murderers of Jews. The giant Torah scholars came from there. The Jews were in France and Germany. Biggest Torah in the world. In these terrible, terrible places. The Jews were in Bavel, Babylonia. Terrible place. Babylon, Babylon was a terrible, the greatest. Rabbi Victor Miller says that the, from the time of the destruction of the temple until now, the greatest time that the Jews ever had was when they were in Babylon. We were independent in Babylonia up until the end of the Jewish greatness then, which came around the, what we call uh, uh, in the time of the Gaonim, let's say, according to the Goyish uh, 11th century. 9th and 10th century. <laughs> the, the worst, worst place in the world, the greatest Jews there ever were. Egypt. Worst, worst place in the world, the greatest Jews that ever lived. So it's very strange that the Jews end up being in the, the greatest the, the Torah comes from these terrible, terrible places. At any rate, if someone cooks by Ur, by the fire, that's called cooking. Now, just like it's forbidden to, to cook by uh, fire, it's forbidden to cook betoledes ha'ur, the derivative of fire. This is a... Torah prohibition. I heat up a piece of metal, okay, on the fire, take it off, and then I put a pot of food on there. It cooks on the, on the hot metal. That's called cooking. Even though it's not on the fire. And it's called Toled Zaur. Derivative of fire is a Torah prohibition, not a rabbinic prohibition. Okay? Kagon liten beitza betzad kadeira. For example, you put a an egg next to, right up next to a hot pot that you took off the fire. You took the pot off the fire and you put an egg next to it. That egg will cook. Or l'shabra al sudar. Or I heated up a, a piece of cloth or a piece of leather and I broke an egg onto it. It'll cook. That's called cooking. And even but, the tolda sahama. What about cooking in sunlight? 
Cooking in sunlight is permitted, but I wouldn't try it. I tried it one time and to heat up some food, it went bad. But food, heating, cooking with, some, in, with something that heated up by the sun, that's forbidden. That I can't do. I can't cook on my roof. I have metal on my roof and it gets very hot in the summertime. I break an egg there and I cook there. That's forbidden because the sun heated up that metal and I cook there. And I forbid cooking up cooking by the thing that was heated up by the sun, lest I come to cook by the thing that was heated up by fire. So therefore that's a rabbinic prohibition, but I'm allowed to cook in the sun, because we don't say that if you let him cook in the sun, he'll cook on the fire. Okay, let's stop for now. Have a good Shabbos.